So last but not least, I'd like to talk to you about this uh, significant multidisciplinary project that we've been working on uh, for the last four or five years, led by my team at PACE, where we're looking at a curative therapy for uh, diabetes and obesity. And interestingly, that's where my research career began in gene therapy. And so it's come back full circle and utilizing that technology. Now, this, it shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody in this room that diabetes and obesity are closely tied together. And we as a civilization are facing one of the biggest epidemics um, of, our, of our civilization in terms of uh, the prevalence rates and the alarming rates that it's uh, increasing by. So just to put that into context, currently, uh, you know, over a 19 year period, up until 2030, it's gonna cost us over one and a half trillion dollars. The annual expenditure on diabetes last year was well over 800 billion and fast. It's climbing very fast as well. And what's really alarming is that over the course of this presentation to date, um, every one of us, if we had diabetes and we had the complications of diabetes, uh, would not have made it through to the end of this presentation because it's killed one person every six seconds. If we look at that from a longitudinal perspective, um, some 30 odd years ago, we only had around 30 million people uh, diagnosed with diabetes. And over the course of that 30 odd years, it's been steadily climbing. <coughs> and then we've seen a significant ramp up in the numbers. And today we have a little under 300 million uh, people affected by this disease. And there were projections a few years ago that by 2030, we will have just under 600 million patients affected by diabetes. So that was the projected trend. But as you'll see, that there's been a little bit of a skew in recent years, and the actual trends are quite alarming. In fact, what it's done is that it's brought that number 10 years forward. It's projected now in just three years time, in 2020, we will have almost 600 million patients suffering from this disease. So how do we plan to tackle it? Because at the moment, we, Matt has already alluded to the different ways in which we are trying to manage the disease. And so our approach is aimed at a curative therapy. And so how does that work? So let me model it to you in this way. In the literature, it's been identified that there are a number of genes that are overexpressed and they are they cause various diseases, be them uh, blood disorders or cancer, etc. Diabetes and obesity is no exception. And so what we found on this model, and this is the model of our plan that we're moving forward on, is that there's a gene that's overexpressed in diabetes and obesity, which causes our body to no longer respond to the effects of insulin. And that's why the question earlier was whether this is on type one or type two, we're predominantly looking at type two, where the body still produces insulin, but it has absolutely no effect on the body. And that's what we term as insulin resistance. And that's because this gene is overexpressed. And in the conjunction with that, overexpression of that gene also sends the body in a spin in terms of how it handles fats. And these more dangerous fats called triglycerides, which I'm sure you've heard of. And so you get increased deposition of these triglycerides in, along with the insulin resistance. And that then presents as hyperglycemia or elevated blood glucose and also vascular disease or cardiovascular disease. And typically we refer to that as being type 2 diabetes and obesity. And so what we aim to do with this project is to target the root cause of the disease using smart FIRNA therapeutics to get right down to the overexpression of that key gene which is implicated in both of those conditions to prevent a progression through this cascade that I've just walked you through. So the key word here is we are working towards a curative therapy, not only a curative but preventative therapy, we're, we're, we're rapidly moving into the world of personalized medicine, right? So we can get our, genet our, our, our uh, genetic profile done and we can identify which mutations we have and then which diseases we're going to be predisposed to later on in life. 
and, and that's a reality that's happening now. So there's a, although I talk about this in the curative sense, in the future, it can also be used in the preventative sense as well. And we're looking at a single gene target using a proprietary chemistry. There are four key steps to this proprietary chemistry. The first two are very common to most research efforts which are conducted within this discipline of gene delivery and gene therapy. I'm going to talk to you about those first. The first is about securing the genetic cargo. And as Mike mentioned before, the siRNA is very different to a small molecule. Imagine it as being a large coil, right? And so this coil is not conducive to entering our cells. And also, in its expanded state, it's very rapidly chopped up by enzymes in our body. And so the first step we need to do is compact and squeeze that coil. And that serves two purposes. It shrinks it in, in size and the molecular volume, so we can actually get it into the cells. But it also stops the enzymes from attacking it, and so it gives it a long <coughs> life within the circulation. Okay, so that's step one. The next step is to get it to the right address. We need to get that genetic cargo to the right tissue. And we'll be focusing on the liver, uh, skeletal muscle, and also fat tissue, because that's where the bulk of the insulin needs to act, uh, and also where most of the fat is deposited. And so we'll be using targeted systems to get the genetic cargo through to the right tissue. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that's predominantly where most research efforts stop, but not with us. We have additional steps which we believe address the key shortfalls of clinical translation of these chemical vectors um, that other parties have been working on. So putting that aside, we also have, in addition to that, a third and a fourth step. So imagine you've got that compacted coil and it's packaged in a carrier system in a targeted way to deliver to your cell of interest. That genetic material is of no value whatsoever if you can't unpack it and then it can't return to its natural conformation, its spring coil uh, conformation. And so the proprietary chemistry that we have de developed actively unpackages the cargo from the package. So that's the, 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 the third step of our technology. The fourth and final step addresses the safety. So what happens is that that coil, that cargo, can then go and bind to its intracellular target. But what happens to the packaging? And that is another key problem in terms of toxicity. And so what we have designed into our carrier systems is a biodegradable feature. So that will degrade not just into anything, but into nutrients that that stressed tissue can then take up to help it to repair and regenerate. So that's the full spectrum of coverage from the, the step one, which is securing the genetic cargo, to delivering it, to releasing it, and then degrading the carrier system so that it doesn't leave any toxic effect where we are. So it's four years of working on the intricacies of packaging the gene, delivering the gene, not only measuring the levels of the target gene that we're trying to reduce, but we're also measuring at the protein level the protein that we want to stop the body from producing and we also have modulated that and last but not least we've across the models that we've been testing we've also been looking at the safety of those as well and that now paves the way to, to work with Prevaceutical to lower the capacity of our tissues to store fat and therefore reduce obesity and at the same time restoring our body's response to insulin and so the cells can then take in the glucose and lower those uh, blood glucose levels so we don't get all of those micro and macrovascular vascular complications <coughs> like kidney failure and blindness and ultimately those uh, uh, complications that kill us, remember one patient every six seconds.